Sounds good, right? Um, also, uh, I don't know why y'all would be trapped up in the attic. That's what I heard him say. So, well, good morning. Scott is on a plane home from Cambodia. Yeah, about now. I think he boarded about a half an hour ago. So he'll be home Monday night. It takes about 36 hours for him to get here. So um, this week we are going to continue in our series called Follower. And what we're doing with that is we're examining, we're wrestling with, we're being challenged by the hard things that Jesus says In the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, Jesus says some hard statements to us as followers, right? And so we're looking at that in our series called Follower. But you and I both know that Jesus isn't the only one who says hard things, yeah? Some things that make us cringe. I know that you have probably said some things that you've like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Or... You've had somebody else say them where you're like, oh, that made me bristle. That's a hard, something hard to hear, right? And maybe those are hard to hear things because they're challenging, like Jesus is challenging us here with the things that he's saying. Or maybe they're hard to hear because they're just unbelievable. You're like, did that really happen? Did what happened just really actually happen? So let me tell you a story about the second category in my life, um, where something that happened that was just hard to believe happened. And it started with this phrase. Tell me if this phrase resonates with you at all. It'll be fine, right? So I was on a business trip actually in Denver, and the group that I was with Uh, went to dinner, and the leader of the group had invited us all over to his really swanky, like, loft apartment on the fifth floor in this really trendy part of Denver. He had planned for us to go to dinner near his apartment, and then for us all to walk. In the summer evening, it was lovely. Down, there's like this river thing that flows through downtown Denver. We went over to his apartment for dessert and to hang out. And this beautiful building used to be like a warehouse. They'd renovated it and converted it into these lofts, yeah? So fifth floor, real swanky. We see the building. It's gorgeous. It's just gorgeous. And you walk into the foyer, and it's stunning. They have done amazing work. Even the elevator is cool. Like, it's one of those old service elevators. And so we walk in. It's been a great time at the meetings we had. It's been a great evening at dinner. The walk was beautiful. We start loading into the elevator. I'm in the beginning of the group, so I go in first. And one of my friends next to me is like, hey, is this going to be okay? This kind of reminds me when I got stuck on the elevator in Sweden. And our leader, gregarious man of God, amazing gentleman, goes, it'll be fine. As the rest of our group, all 28 of them, piled into this elevator. Do you know where the story is going? I'll tell you where this story is going. It's going not five levels up, but one and a half. One and a half levels up. Yep. So somewhere in there, we got stuck on an elevator. And I think I actually have a picture of it if we want to throw that up there. There's not, you can't even see all of us. We're packed in. And so the guy that's in the front left of the big head, I mean, the, well, it's not, he doesn't have a big head, but it's, That's the guy that was stuck in the elevator in Sweden. A little PTSD for him as flashbacks. So we're stuck, and what are we going to do? And, you know, you find out real quick who's claustrophobic. And I was in the back corner, so I don't know what happened at the front, but somewhere somebody managed to open the doors, probably because it's an old service elevator, thank God, opened the doors, and we were all able to, one by one, climb up out of this into the second level and walk the three flights up to our destination at this loft apartment that's just gorgeous, where we had dessert and then laughed about our shared experience. Do you know that crisis creates bonding? (laughs) So those 28 people, man, we will always have Denver. No matter where we see each other, we're like, hey, (laughs) remember that one time? (laughs) Right? And I know things like this don't just happen to me. I know that we all have things in our lives where we're like, oh, that one time where it's all going to be fine was a giant lie, 
right? It wasn't fine for that elevator until the next afternoon I heard that they went and got it fixed and it was functioning again. But that day, that night, everything was not fine. And so sometimes when I hear that phrase, it reminds me of Denver and the elevator, and I bristle a little bit. I'm like, oof, it's not fine. And sometimes I catch my say, myself saying, it's going to be fine. I'm like, ooh, but what if it's not? Because I've had experience where it's not, you know? And so we all have those experiences where we've said things or we've heard things, and they're hard to hear, and it can be simple and innocuous and harmless, like it's going to be fine, but it's not. So this morning, we get to join Jesus as he gives us something that's hard to hear, something that makes us bristle and cringe. And his statement isn't as simple, isn't as innocent, and not harmless as we're listening to it. It has more of an impact for us when we hear it. And so he doesn't say things when he gives us those hard to hear statements just to be mean, right? That's not Jesus's heart. And he doesn't say things that are hard to hear So that maybe we'll listen, right? Maybe we'll stop and think. He says the hard-to-hear statements because he wants to grab our attention and evoke change, right? He wants us to change our behavior as we're saying this. And so he makes a cringeworthy statement. And it's not a gotcha, right? It's more of a, hey, listen up, pay attention, Because if you hear what I'm saying, if you actually hear what I'm saying and implement in in your life, it will radically change the way you live. So as we join him today, we're going to be in Mark chapter 8. So second book in the Bible, or second book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark. We're going to be here this morning. And let me set up what's happening, okay? Jesus is for Jesus. We like it when Jesus teaches. And he's hanging out with his disciples, and he kind of throws out this statement to his disciples, just kind of casually. He goes, who do you think I am? And they respond, and they say, well, you're the Messiah. And Jesus is like, okay, we have a problem, right? Jesus recognizes that this is going to be an issue for them. Because in their minds, Messiah is ruler and not the prince of peace that Jesus intends to be. Messiah means king, but like warrior king. I'm coming back. We're taking Jerusalem. Let's go, right? Like that's what they have in their minds. When they think Messiah, they think Jesus is coming back in force. And so Jesus thinks, man, okay, here's the problem, right? And so he responds to this, you know, Messiah statement, and he's got to break the news to them that it's not what they think it is. So he basically says, listen, what you're expecting of me is not what I came here to do. Yeah? He says, let me tell you what this is going to look like. Let me tell you how this is going to play out. And so he goes through and he tells them he's going to suffer, and he's going to be rejected, and he's going to die. And then three days later, he'll rise again. Now, if I think like the disciples do, and there are some of them I think I'm more like, I probably tuned out around the, you're going to suffer and get rejected and die. Time out, right? I don't hear the rest of the story as he's talking. And then, don't you just love Peter? He's such a goof. Because he's always the one that's showing his, like, humanity. And I think, man, if Jesus chose him, he didn't choose John the Beloved to start his church. He chose Peter, the one who's always like, Peter. Like, and so it gives me hope. And so Peter hears, like, Peter, what are you doing? Jesus has just talked about, listen, I'm going to suffer, be rejected, and die. And Peter's like, i got to correct this. Peter pulls Jesus aside to correct him. I'm sorry, wait. Can you imagine trying to correct the Son of God? You literally just said he's the Messiah, and in your mind, that means warrior king. And you're going to pull him aside and go, whoa, bro, let's adjust what you just said, right? And so Mark tells us, he's saying that Mark tells us that Peter pulled Jesus aside to correct him. 
And you can imagine Peter here. He goes, Jesus, really? Like, I've seen you calm a storm. I've seen you walk on water. People love you. You're the Messiah. It's going to be great. And Jesus is like, hold up. What does Jesus say to Peter? Get away from me, Satan. You're thinking in just man's way of thinking, not God's, right? You're seeing things merely from a human standpoint, not from God's. Well, that escalated quickly. <laughs> Get away from me, Satan? Can you imagine if Jesus came up, to me, came up to you and called you Satan? It's a little harsh, right? Like, how do you recover in that conversation? Peter's like, uh, okay. But you know why Jesus does this, right? Because Peter didn't realize what's going on. Peter doesn't get it. He inadvertently tries to get Jesus off mission, tries to distract him and put him like off focus. So Jesus puts Peter in his place. And we understand this correction is huge for Peter and it's huge for us too. And here's why. Because if we're honest, sometimes the things that God wants from us are, don't align with what we want for us, right? And even when we know that God has revealed his plan to us, even when he's so kind to do that ahead of time, we fight it. You ever fight what you know God has for you in your life? And so we know that what's best for us in God's perspective may not always align with, with, with what we think is best for us. And so Jesus calls Peter out. And he just simply says, you're not acting like a follower. Which a follower is someone who does what the person they're following is doing, right? It's like a game of follow the leader. Do you remember that as a kid? You put your left hand up, you put your left hand up. You put your right hand up, we put our left right hand up. You, you move to the left, oh, I'll move to the left. We move to the right, okay, I'll move to the right. We pray for her, we pray for her, we suffer and die. Wait a minute. Wait, if I'm following. Hold on, back it up. Right? We copy what the leader does, we do what they do, even if it's not something we want to do. And so Jesus knows that the reason why Peter doesn't, want to hear about what Jesus is saying is going to happen is not necessarily because of what's going to happen to Jesus, but it's because it hasn't been for Peter too, right? Oh, I'm a follower. Who are you following? Jesus. Okay, so you, when you move to the left, you move to the left. And when he moves to the right, you move to the right. And when he prays for her, you pray for her. And when he suffers and dies, wait a minute, back it up. Jesus knew this about Peter. He wasn't as concerned as what was going to happen to Jesus as he probably was concerned about what that meant for him. And so it's at this point that Jesus decides to create a teaching moment. Don't we love teaching moments? No, it means because we're being corrected. <laughs> so Jesus says this. At this point, he's with Peter. They kind of turn from the disciples. He turns back from the disciples. disciples and we know that he, he says this, then calling the crowd to join his disciples. So he turns, and instead of joining just the disciples, he calls the crowd that's kind of over here. Why? Because I'm not going to waste this on just my little group. I want everybody to hear this. And he's about to explain what it means to be a follower. Because Peter wasn't acting like a follower. So what does it actually mean to be a follower? He's about to reveal that. And so he calls the whole group, and he doesn't want anybody to miss it. And what we need to realize in this next hard-to-hear statement is that it's really hard for the people who are listening to hear it. And we don't quite get it, how hard it was for them to hear what he's about to say. Because here's what he says. Then, calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Okay, fine. Take up your cross and follow me. Jesus just made it real. That was hard for his listeners to hear because he basically told them, hey, this is going to cost you something. 
And so often you and I think that Jesus is just our big buddy, right? Hey, Jesus, what do you think about this thing that I'm about to do? Oh, okay, great. And then we just do the thing that we're going to do, right? And we go through our days and our weeks and our years even with the misbelief that we just kind of invite him into this or that. And we don't really press into relationship or what he wants from us. We try to figure out what we want from him. And so in that, when we live in that misguidedness, instead of seeking what he wants from us, we're seeking what we want from him, we, we think that we're called to happiness. We're called to easiness. We're called to painlessness. And that's not what Jesus is saying here at all, right? Check it out. Jesus said, if we call ourselves followers, there will be times when we have to give up our way, our will for his, for the better good, even when we don't like it. And let's be clear, this isn't a huge theological idea that we're talking about. Like, Jesus, this isn't new to you and I. If we'd never been in church before, you and I are familiar with this concept. We go out to dinner. Afterwards, they bring us by the dessert menu, and we're like, no, I don't think I'm going to do that tonight, right? We're used to giving up something we may want for something else. And maybe that something else with the dessert menu is because we don't, you know, it's a health choice, or it's a wallet choice, or it's a we're already so full we have a stomach ache, right? We're used to giving up something to get something else or for something else. We're used to this idea. Be, be at times. There are going to be times when what God wants from me and what I want for me are in conflict. They don't line up. And at that point, I have a choice to make. We have a choice to make. Are we going to behave like a follower and choose to do what he wants us to do? He's asked us to move left. Are we going to move left? Even though in my heart, I want to move right, right? Right? Are we going to be a follower or are we going to choose to do our own thing? So, to drive the point home in his, hey, this is what it takes to be a follower story, comment, hard to hear statement, Jesus makes this statement. And the picture is crystal clear for his listeners. They know what he is talking about. It wouldn't be lost on them. It kind of gets lost on us. But he says it. what he's saying when he says, I want you to take up your cross. Now, in our culture, we have this phrase that misrepresents what Jesus says here. You know, maybe you have a horrible job, or maybe you have a bum knee, or maybe you have a crazy mother-in-law, and you say, that's just my cross to bear, right? Right? That's not what Jesus is saying here. He's talking about a literal, physical cross. And we do these weird things with crosses, right? We, because we know of the crucifixion and the resurrection, we see a cross. Do we, we used to have one on stage somewhere. We see a cross as a symbol of hope. Is anybody wearing a cross today? Does anybody have a tattoo of a cross? Yes. We put them in our churches. We put them in our homes. How weird would that have been for the people that Jesus was talking to that day? The Mark 8 group, the Mark 8 crowd would have thought that's real crazy. Because at this time, Jesus hadn't been crucified yet. The only thing they knew the cross to be was death. And it wasn't a symbol of death. It was an actual physical way to torture and kill felons. The government used it as a way to show everybody else this is not how we behave. And so when he says, take up your cross, it means, hey, they would have them, like we know Jesus did, carry their own cross up to the point where they would execute the prisoners, the felons. That's not something we, we really get, right? So 
Jesus at this point, when they hear that, he's not saying, listen, by following me, it may mean you get uncomfortable. No, he goes extreme. He's saying, following me may cost you something that you value the most. He's saying, following me, if you so choose to follow me, you're going to have to be willing to deny yourself even to death. And you know the crowd had to be terrified. That was real freaky for him to bring this up because we don't get crucified like they get it. Like if he would have said, hey, you know, take up your cross and follow me. If he would have said, hey, take up your electric chair and follow me. We're like, oh, that's not okay, Jesus, you know? We don't get the emotional rage, the visceral reaction that they would have gotten when, they, when he said, take up your cross and follow me. But I think we get it conceptually, right? We can figure it out. And I think that you and I both can agree that we would imagine some people in the crowd are going to be like, I'm out. <laughs> like, what? It just happened here. Listen, the miracles are great. I heard you walked on water. Incredible. I heard you fed thousands with just a loaf of bread and some fish. Amazing. But this, I'm going to just show myself to the door because this is asking too much. This is just too crazy. It got a little weird and culty just now, right? And this is where we have something in common with a crowd of the day. Because even if we remove the fact that we know about the crucifixion and the resurrection, even if we like get on the same page, we have something in common with the crowd of that day because we don't mind following Jesus just like they did. Love seeing the miracles. That's super cool, incredible, amazing. We don't mind following Jesus as long as it doesn't cost us too much. Do you think it's why people, maybe they don't come to church or they just come to church a couple times a year? Because the U.S. still identifies as 65% Christian. And in our valley, it's more. So why don't they come to church better, better yet? Why don't they apply Jesus' teachings to their lives? I wonder if it's because they know that Jesus isn't interested in part. Jesus isn't interested in what's convenient. Jesus is not interested in one morning a week. Jesus wants the whole of us. He wants our whole being. He wants us to be committed to be following, not just with a thumb or a toe. He wants our whole body and our whole self to be in this thing. So let's talk about us. What does it take for us to be followers? Because we've talked about the fact that sometimes we go through and we say, God, will you do this? God, could you do this? God, why didn't you do this? Instead of asking the questions that aren't focused on what we want, but are focused on, focused on what he wants. And so the questions we get to ask her, God, what do you want of me? God, where are you leading me? God, where do you want me to follow you? In this situation, in this moment, in this season, God, what do you want of me? Where do you want me to follow you? Where are you leading me? Because I think if we looked at the world through the eyes of plain follow the leader, he moves to the right, we move to the right. He prays for her, we pray for her. That we would seldom go through life without having it impact the way that we think and act. Because I think we would know as we pass somebody who doesn't know Jesus and we're playing follow the leader, we're, we're following what Jesus would have us to do, we would want them to know about Jesus. The, the anger and the bitterness that we often hold on to wouldn't be as much of a big deal because we following the leader and where he would lead us would be different than where we would lead ourselves in that moment and that when somebody pours out their heart to us and unloads all their problems that how we respond to them may be a way to love them sit with them pray with or for them as we follow our leader so when we don't look to him and we look to us, we look to ourselves and our own wants, it's easy for us to slip into this like rote style of Christianity where we may say, this, say the right things, right? And we may look the part, but our faith 
costs us very little. Here's something we need to remember. We aren't who we say we are. We are what we actually do, right? We're real good at giving lip service to our faith. We're real good at saying the things but not doing the things. And so when we ask those questions, when we follow our leader, it puts into practice doing so that we see the change. We're not, we can't just declare ourselves followers and let it not impact our lives. We can't be followers and it not change our behavior. We can't be followers and it not influence the way we go about our lives. If we say we're followers and we actually follow our leader, it will always, always result in action. It'll change who we are and how we function and what we do. So today, during worship or t- this afternoon when you're out grocery shopping or at whatever you need to do, errands you need to run, or this evening with your family or friends, or this week at work, this is our challenge. We get to ask ourselves these questions. Lord, what would you have me do? Lord, where are you leading me? Lord, where am I supposed to be following you? Even into places that I don't want to go. And here's what we know. Here's the warning. We start to ask ourselves questions. And (laughs) this is why I never pray for patience is because he might give me opportunities to exercise patience. So as we pray, Lord, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? Where are you leading me? Be careful. Because he may answer you. And the answer may include something that is far more costly than you expected it to be. Let's pray. Lord, we love you (laughs) and we want to follow. And we know our flesh gets in the way. The things we want to do get in the way. So Lord, simplify it this week for us as we head in to make it as easy as a, do we want dessert? Nah, I really shouldn't. Do I need to pray for her? Yeah, I really should. Kind of choice. Where what you've asked us to do and to live out, and not just say, but do. Lord, help us to be a true follower of you this week. As we go about our business, let our business be that of kingdom business this week. In the simple things and the hard things, Lord God, be with us, empower us, Holy Spirit, guide us as we embark on this journey of being a follower. For those of us who are newer to it and those of us who have done it for a long time, Lord God, one road, one direction, same thing, Lord God, remind us what it takes to be a follower and speak to us clearly about what it is you would have us to do today and this week in this place. Lord, we love you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.